So why analyze RAM? It, RAM, everything goes through RAM. Every bit of data goes through RAM. And there is, uh, before it's stored to disk, before it's printed, before it's uh, even displayed on the screen, it goes, the data goes through RAM. Uh, and this includes web browsing, it includes uh, creation or editing of documents, viewing graphics, uh, executing applications, applications even that the user didn't intend to ex uh, execute, like malware, and then also sending and receiving network data. All this goes through the RAM. So the data contained in RAM is generally newer than the data that is saved to the storage drive of the computer. Uh, and there are pieces of data that may only uh, ever exist in RAM. In other words, it's in RAM only, never makes it to, uh, to any uh, disk storage. There's so much information being stored in the cloud, and much of this exists only in the cloud and not within uh, a storage device, a volume actually on the host computer or even an attached device. Uh, so some of those artifacts from that cloud storage may exist in RAM. Same thing with network attached devices. Uh, the, uh, there may be artifacts uh, showing connectivity to those remote volumes that only exist in RAM. And I mentioned malware. Malware and the functions of malware may only exist in RAM. There may be executables that uh, are saved, but the actual existence of their being executed and how they're running only exist in RAM. Uh, things like direct kernel object manipulation is where malware can hide itself from several Windows processes, such as the task manager. Operations such as NetStat, uh, the uh, and other triage tools, uh, they're rendered ineffective by uh, uh, malware uh, often only occurring in RAM. Uh, RAM collection and analysis may be the only way to determine what is going on or what has gone on with a computer. And another point is encryption. When a user interacts with data, the interaction is unencrypted. As, as the data, as the user is interacting with the data, the, the user is not, the user is not uh, interacting with the encrypted data, they're interacting with the unencrypted data. So it's in, in RAM, it's stored as unencrypted. It's only when it gets written out to the file that you encounter that encryption process. So RAM is, uh, is a type of storage. It's, it's available. Why not collect it? There are a lot of tools out there that are designed to collect Windows RAM. And we're going we're gonna to focus our discussion today on Windows RAM. But uh, Mac RAM exists also. And one of our tools, Macquisition, can be used to collect RAM uh, from from Max, and we'll we'll cover that another time. But today we're focusing on Windows RAM. So, in whatever tool you use to collect RAM, you can bring that data into a variety of different tools, including Blacklight. A couple things about RAM. You might want to uh, put RAM in in some common format, like an EO1 file, and Macquisition would will actually give you an ability to collect RAM in an EO1 format, but avoid doing that. I know we're all familiar with the EO1 format. It's been around forever. It's bulletproof, but avoid doing that. Keep it in a raw file and don't put it into segments because uh, most RAM analysis tools, including Blacklight, uh, don't like to see RAM in segments. They want it in, in single files, in a single raw image. So when you're collecting RAM, you want to make sure you're using a tool that you've tested. Because when you're collecting RAM, you're, you're doing it live. Uh, you're doing it on a live computer. So it's, it's important that you test your RAM collection tool that you're familiar with how it works and you're comfortable with how it works, trying to doing so on, on live evidence. 
And again, as I mentioned, collect that RAM as raw and avoid using an, an EO1 segment. Just keep it as a, a raw single image uh, segment. All right, Bruce, you want to talk about uh, triage versus full process of RAM? Absolutely. So bringing, uh, once you've got your RAM collected from whichever tool you're using, uh, and again, as Bob said, it's always best to, to RAM in a raw format. Uh, RAM is essentially a blob of data. So um, a raw format is quite commonly best. One other thing that you should be mindful of is that there's a lot of compression going on in RAM right now. So if the computer says it's got eight gig of RAM, you may find that your RAM image is a little bit bigger than that. It can be anywhere up to uh, 12 gigs, 13 gigs, and, and sometimes even higher depending upon the usage on the computer. So be mindful of the fact that there's a lot of compression going on. Once you have that RAM image, you can then bring that into tools such as Blacklight. Bringing it into Blacklight is very easy. It's just like adding a disk image into, bla into Blacklight. Once you're there, you're presented with two options. You can either triage the RAM, or you can do full processing of the RAM. Basically, if you do triaging the RAM, this can be done rather quickly. And what this is going to give you, and we'll demonstrate this in a few minutes, is this is going to show you the, the processes, library sockets, and handles, and drivers on that, that are actually being run on that actual computer at that time. Now, these are parsed out by Blacklight. Now, this is going to give you a really good baseline in, of the details of what's happening on the computer. So you ask yourself, you say, well, okay, what does all this mean? So the processes are actually the live running processes that are actually happening on the computer at the time. Now, you may, things such as the task manager some, quite often can show this, and certainly um, uh, triage tools can pull this type of information out. But, but remember that some of those tasks may actually be hidden. And I'm thinking specifically of, of malware. But what happens is, is malware still has to make a call to RAM at some point in time. When malware makes that call to RAM, it's going to get registered within RAM, and it has to do that. That's just the way it is. The other, other things we're talking about that are automatically parsed out are the libraries. Libraries are the DIL files, those DIL files that we find on every Windows case. Well, these are the DIL files that are actively being used on the system at that time. Those DIL files are going to be parsed out immediately. The sockets are the live network connections. So these are network connections that the computer has actively or is actively using or has recently used. So these sockets are going to be displayed. Handles are Windows services, such as the creation of event logs that are, that are being, um, that the Windows operating system is running through RAM. And lastly, drivers, well, they're the drivers. Simply put, those are the, the actual drivers for, that are being used on the Windows system at that time. So all these things are going to be parsed out. Now, one thing that we've, we try and emphasize is triaging RAM is quite often done at live at the scene, whether you're attending a search warrant or a data collection in a, in a corporate situation, you may want to get that data live. And it can be done rather quickly. Generally speaking, depending upon the speed of your computer, you can usually do eight gigs of RAM in about 10 to 12 minutes of processing. So that's very quick considering on scene. Now, of course, that is very dependent upon your machine. It also depends on the, on the the connection that you've got to your machine, uh, the external source. The last option that Blacklight will give you is full processing of the evidence. That will, that will then do everything that the triage is doing, but includes built-in content searches. Here's a list of these built-in content searches. These are automatically run by Blacklight. So you're going to see internet searches, email domains, so it's going to show you the actual email addresses, any URLs that are listed, phone numbers, RFC 822 headers, JSON data, GPS data, EXIF data, email addresses, internet domains, internet searches, zip files, IP address, and Ethernet MAC addresses. These are all going to be shown directly within Blacklight. And we'll see this in, in like 30 seconds when we, when we switch over and start looking at our, our um, memory image. But these internet searches are going to be there. Now keep in mind, if we're running a full processing on a memory image, that's going to significantly increase the time. These content searches are actual keyword searches that are being run against that RAM. 
and of course that can that can dramatic have a dramatic impact on the on the length of time it takes to parse out that memory. Bruce, one yeah. thing I want to point out here is if you're processing Windows volumes uh, generally, you already you don't have to fully process RAM to get contents of RAM because Windows uses swap files. So Blacklight will parse uh, the, the swap files, the, uh, the page file, sys files, and the hybrid fill sys file from a Windows volume. They're already collected for you if you've required that Windows volume. So why not let Blacklight process them and you'll be surprised uh, what kind of data you find in there. The same kinds of processes can run against hybrid fill sys and page file sys uh, as with general RAM, all these content searches. Uh, recovering of uh, uh, artifacts, carving files, and so, et cetera, and you'd be surprised what you get just out of HyperFill and, and page file sys files. Great, thanks, Bob. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go and start looking at our memory image um, and start looking exactly what's happened. Now, what we've done here is we've taken a memory image of a Windows 10 system. This is a, a live memory off of a Windows 10 system. We just used a, a, a one of the free tools that you can easily download to that gathers Windows memory. There's lots of them out there in the market. Uh, big suggestion is just make sure that the memory image is in a proprietary format. Like Bob said, the best best possible one that you can use is, of course, a um, a raw image. Uh, some of them might call it .dmp for dump. Others might call it, you know, .dd. There's all sorts of things, uh, extensions that they may put on it. But essentially, it is a raw image dump. Looking at the RAM in Blacklight, we can automatically see that we have our memory image showing. It's going to tell us exactly what operating system this is taken from. So this is Windows 10. It's giving you the version number, and it's a 64-bit edition of RAM. RAM is parsed out by Blacklight under the System tab. So if I scroll over to the System tab and click System, you're going to see these processes, libraries, sockets, handles, and drivers. These are the, um, these are the actual um, artifacts that are being parsed out by, when, by Blacklight from the operating system. Now, there's a lot of really good features within here. If you look at the processes, these are the active running processes on this computer, and you can see them all listed as you go down. You have a lot of uh, built-in Windows services, such as service host.exe. That's quite typical. You would see that in an, uh, uh, on most Windows cases. Um, you go up further, we can see um, you know, smss.exe, et cetera, Explorer, which everybody knows. Um, you can even see the tool that we used. In this case, we used Magnet RAM Capture to grab the RAM. That's running in there. Bootcamp EXE, because this is a Bootcamp, um, bootcamp uh, Windows machine. iTunes is running. If we go down, we can also see Shiraza. For those of you who have conducted uh, child exploitation cases, uh, Shiraza is, quite, is used quite commonly, along with other peer-to-peer -to -peer tools for, for exchanging child exploitation material. If I click on Shiraza and come down below to um, come down below, and I'm just going to drag this up here, I can start looking at everything that is happening with the actual Shiraza app. So if I click on libraries, these are the actual DIL files, the DLLs that Shiraza is accessing. Now, you've got to keep in mind that that the idea here is, is to demonstrate using one application. But if you think of this as potentially a malware case in a corporate espionage case or some other, some other um, um, type of uh, investigation, if you select the actual file, you can, you can see what is running and how, the, how these actual extensions are being used by the operating system. These could essentially point to specific malware instances on the computer. Same if we look at sockets. Clicking on sockets, we are going to see that the network addresses being accessed by this application. In this situation, we have the process name, the date and time, the port being accessed by this particular application, the protocol, whether it's TCP version 6 or 4, 
uh, UDP or whatever type of uh, connect, network connection, the local IP address and any remote IP addresses and port that this is connected to. This is rather important. If this was a child exploitation case and we were on scene at that case, um, we could run, in, run our RAM image against Blacklight and in a matter of minutes we could potentially um, identify uh, further suspects in this case. You can also notice that you have a state here. Established meaning it's an active connection and closed meaning it was a connection that was open and is now closed. So in this situation, because this computer was actually actively running Shiraz at the time when the RAM capture was, was created, we've potentially got one, two, three, four, five, six IP addresses that this, um, this computer is connected to. So if those IP addresses were actively sharing child exploitation material, they, would, uh, they could potentially identify other suspects. We can take that a little further if you want. We can also notice that we have some cloud services up and running. We have iCloudServices.exe, we have OneDrive.exe, and iCloudPhotos.exe. If we click on iCloudPhotos.exe, we can see these remote addresses. Now, I know these remote addresses belong to Apple because I've already tested them and checked it. So, but if this was a situation where potentially this was a um, um, corporate espionage or, or, or um, some sort of case where, where uh, people are stealing uh, intellectual property um, and transferring it to another user, another computer, or potentially to another device somewhere, this could effectively identify where that's coming from. And this is done within a matter of minutes. So that's, that's really helpful and beneficial in your cases. If you want to slide over to uh, content searches, I can let Bob take over on content searches. Okay, yes, uh, we get calls all the time from uh, corporate or corporate customers looking at ways to identify exfiltration of data, uh, theft of intellectual property, corporate espionage, as Bruce said, and this is a you know a great new tool or, or an additional tool to add to uh, a tool chest. So with content searches, uh, these are run automatically during the full processing of memory. Uh, again, memory, live memory, or uh, memory conducted on a page file or hyperfill sys files. Uh, they're, they're running what's called uh, the bulk extractor process. So these are, are pretty standard searches. Um, as uh, we can select, for instance, internet services or internet searches and see uh, here where uh, an internet search was being conducted and you can see the progression of the search actually being typed in the, the search bar here. Uh, this is a function of uh, Google but looking for a roll, uh, they're looking for roll back odometer, a tool for rolling back an odometer and you can see how uh, the progression of that search was entered in there um, from the uh, the different memory capture there. So, go ahead, Bruce. No, sorry about that. And the other good thing about all this is, is even although these ones are built into Blacklight, this certainly doesn't preclude you from creating your own searches that might be useful in your own um, industries um, for searching with Absolutely. So you can certainly yeah, add your own searches to this. Yeah, keyword searches are, or as I like to uh, call them, I instead of keyword searches, text string searches. Uh, we can run text string searches against the contents of RAM or the page file or, or hyperfill sys files. If there's a particular keyword or text string that you're looking for, uh, including a regular expression, uh, we've, we've done some of the common ones for you already, the phone numbers, the IP addresses, uh, email addresses, internet domains, and so forth. But if there are text strings that are unique to your case that you want to run, you can certainly run these uh, just as you would against any other data. 